This guide has been designed to ensure that you learn the fundamentals and get your community up and running as soon as possible. First, we'll be exploring or discovering what online communities actually are because understanding the nature and purpose of community is important for building a fulfilling one yourself. You need to understand the vehicle that you plan on driving. The second thing that we'll be covering is what it actually means to be a community builder because you need to understand your role to most effectively serve your members. Next up, we're gonna discover how you can fulfill your community members because their sustained contributions and level of fulfillment are pivotal to the long-term success of your community. After that, we'll discover how to effectively onboard members because you need to know how to set expectations for your members and give them a clear path to follow within your community. That's very important. And then five, discover how to get feedback from your members because understanding their needs, wants, goals, and experiences will help you continuously optimize your community to better serve them. And in this module, we'll be discussing what online communities actually are. I think a lot of us take it for granted that we know what they are because we've had experience with them, but we need to really sit down and focus and determine what exactly is an online community. So we'll start off with a definition. And because it's important to understand the vehicle that you plan on driving, if you plan on building a community or if you're currently building one, then you need to know the vehicle that you're driving, which is an online community. And simply put, an online community is a network organized around common interests and experiences where a sense of mutual welfare exists among members. And if there's anything to take away from this definition, it's that a community is a peer-to-peer -peer network. Therefore, the core purpose of an online community is to serve as a peer-to-peer -peer network with you being the facilitator of these peer-to-peer -peer connections. And this is where the community effect comes into play. Now, let's look at the community effect visually speaking. So as you can see, you have you at the top here. You're the community builder or owner. And these colored circles here are all your members. Let's say, for example, for visual representation's sake. And these links that are connecting all of the members and you together are the relationships that are formed within your community. And what's important to note is that these relationships are, you know, very spread out. It's, it's a network and they're mutual, right? So you can see that green is associated with blue and vice versa. Yellow is associated with pink and vice versa. But each of these members are also associated with you. This is the community effect represented visually. Now, if the connection, for whatever reason, erodes or becomes weak or breaks between you and a member, the member will likely stay because of the connections they've made with other members in your community. And this is very important. This is what's called the community effect, and it helps keep members in your community. And there's a great way of putting this into a quote, which is that members join because of the creator, you, and stay for the community. So oftentimes you see this with content creators, influencers, whatever you want to call them, what happens is their audience joins their community because they want to get closer to the content creator in question, but then they end up just staying for the people in the community that they met, the peers, the like-minded individuals that they've associated themselves with, and that's what you're striving for in your community. You want these bonds to be formed between members and not just with you and your members on an individual basis. So this is what you want. You want the community effect in your online community. Now, this is what you don't want. You don't want the guru effect. So the guru effect, as you can see, is a little bit more simple compared to the network of the community effect. In the case of the guru effect, there is only a one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and individual members. So as you can see, there is no interconnectedness. There is no relationships that are being formed between the individual members amongst themselves. This is not what you want. You do not want this. But in all likelihood, your community is going to start at this point, right? Because when people come to you first, they're most familiar with you. So it's very important that while your community may start and look like this, visually speaking, it's important that over time, you try your best to establish bonds between not just only you, but indeed the members. 
Now with the guru effect, if the connection between you and a member breaks, the member will likely leave the community. And so this can lead to churn, especially in paid communities. So it's very important that although you may start like this in your community, that you end up like this or that you aim for this. That's very important. As far as action steps going forwards, just answer the following question. So what specific interests do your members have? It's the very first important question to ask. Because if you emphasize these interests, subjects, themes in your community, it has the power to further unite your members. So for example, here in Community Builders, the common interest you could say is community building on school with the purpose of providing fulfilling community experiences. But of course this will differ, the interests will differ depending on your community. So in the context of say a bodybuilding one, it would be bodybuilding with the purpose of bulking or a philosophy community, stoicism, with the purpose of mastering one's emotions, etc. The next question you're going to want to ask yourself is what experiences do your members have in common? And you want to emphasize these experiences in your community because again, they have the power to further unite your members. So for example, a common experience that members have in community builders is struggling with community engagement. In a bodybuilding community, it would be perhaps struggling with being skinny fat, or in a stoicism community, it would be falling prey to negative emotions, etc. Now the third question is how can you get your members to start caring about each other's progress? And in so doing, you're going to come up with incentive systems to get your members to start posting more, liking each other's contributions, and initiating discussions. And for example, this could look like featuring challenges, hosting live call events, starting discussions, etc. Sky's the limit in terms of the creative solutions that you can have to answer this question. Welcome to the second module of this course where we will be discussing your role as a community builder. And before we get into the details of what your role is as a community builder, let's just entertain a thought experiment for a moment. So if you left your community for an indefinite period of time, how long would it last before falling apart? Be honest, would it last a day, a couple of hours, a week, longer? Actually think about this scenario for a moment and give it a guess. And then after thinking of an answer, ask yourself what kinds of self-sustaining systems could you put in place to ensure that you have the choice to leave your community, but of course decide not to? You want to be in a position where you don't have to engage with your community as the community builder. Because as we discussed in the previous module, what's important is that you want to start creating and putting into place these systems where bonds are formed between all of your members. And so you're no longer the priority in terms of where these relationships are being established. You want to establish these relationships first and foremost in your members. That's what you want to focus on. So it's not to say that you shouldn't engage, but it's to say that you want to be in a position where it's a choice whether or not you engage. That's a powerful position to be in. So this thought experiment puts your role as a community builder into perspective. Your role as a community builder is to be active. Don't get me wrong, okay? but also to position yourself in such an advantageous way that you don't have to be active, which is what I just mentioned. So you choose to be active rather than being forced to. That's very important. And this makes community building work better for you in the long term because the burden of responsibility to provide a fulfilling community experience no longer falls 100% on your shoulders, which is great. But more importantly, this mindset inspires the right kind of strategic focus for you going forward which is to focus on implementing systems that bridge strong connections between members such that if you were to leave for say a week or two, your community members wouldn't even notice. And so as a community builder, this is simply the best case scenario for you. This is ideal and this is what we are striving for. Striving for this outcome will of course take time, but it's worth the effort and the learning materials in this course will get you to this point faster. Now let's discuss your role. There has never been a time in human history where it has ever been this easy to connect people together from all around the world. Back in the day, the scope of a community was more often than not limited to your town, village, or city. For example, tradesmen, such as the fellows in this image, would form guilds with other local tradesmen to discuss their craft in an effort to perfect it. This was the equivalent of a school community back then. Think about it. 
Could you imagine what guys like that could do with an internet connection and a school community to their name? Simply put, the internet has been a game changer. And for all its pitfalls, the internet does indeed have some highlights, which is you. Because think about it. If you're planning on leading the future of belonging by facilitating the bridging of connections between people from all around the world, then you're providing a service that does a lot of real good for the world. A project such as building a community rises above the all too common doomer narrative that the world is more divided than ever. You'd be actively countering this pessimistic worldview by uniting people under a common mission or purpose. And that's a highlight, at least in my books. So if you're reading this, you've been blessed with the opportunity to leverage the internet to your advantage, a tool that your ancestors can only dream of wielding to their designs. Therefore, your immediate mission, should you choose to accept it, is to start creating a fulfilling community experience by bridging people together from all around the world. Moreover, your long-term mission involves laying the foundations of your community in such a way that if you were to leave it for a certain period of time, it would function on its own, independent of your presence, empowered by the strong connections formed between its members. A community where you choose to engage with it instead of needing to engage with it as if it were some kind of chore. We don't want that. We want to be able to have the choice to engage with our community and to engage with it when we want to. Obviously, when you're starting off, you have to put in the legwork, but this is what we're striving for. So ideally, you're striving to build a community that lives up to this standard. Remember this. This is really important. This is your role as a community builder. Now, don't carry the world on your shoulders, okay? Don't be this guy. Because there's no sugarcoating this fact, community building is time consuming. Sometimes you'll spend hours at your desk, glued to your screen for multiple days in a row, wondering why you've even started a community in the first place. And it's in moments like these where quitting starts to look like a viable option. But it's also in these moments where you prove to yourself who you are and what you're made of. They say that you can't teach heart, but you can teach community building. So take the following advice seriously because it will help you avoid scenarios where you're second guessing your reasons for doing this in the first place. So as much as your role as a community builder involves you bridging connections and maintaining high standards for your members' experiences, you come first because if you grind nonstop and end up burning out and are no longer able to bring your best work to the table, who will in your place? Think about it. Therefore, if at any point the work becomes too much for you to bear alone, share the responsibilities with others who are willing to help out. It may take some time before you get to this point, but get yourself a community manager if you can. In fact, that's what I do for a living, actually. I manage a community called Cal's Country Club and a community called the 30 Day Brain Reset, which saves the owner, Cal, dozens of hours a week. Hours that he could spend working on his business and actually driving traffic to these communities in the first place. So if a community manager isn't feasible though, being a part of groups like Community Builders will level up your community building and management game. So if you're here listening to this course right now, you've made the right choice. You can learn a lot from just being a part of a group like this and you could save yourself lots of time too, which is really important. So start now, ask questions later. Being a community builder is a skillful endeavor, and like any other skill, you'll make progress in it the more you work at it. It's as simple as that. I've put in the reps for two years in this area, and I still feel like a newcomer to this game at times because there's so much to learn and just so much to do. But let me tell you this. Just getting started puts you ahead of 99% of people. Or as the saying goes, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time is now. So as you can see, there's this gentleman planting a wonderful little tree over here. Also, community building is such a niche skill in the grand scheme of things that if you were to start taking it seriously today and growing your community to the best of your abilities, you'd be a part of an elite group of networking pioneers, community builders as it were. I know, roll credits. But you're already here, so put in the work and let's start winning. Welcome to this module. In it, we'll be discussing member fulfillment and how you can go about fulfilling your community members. So first and foremost, what does it mean to fulfill? Well, it means to bring to completion or reality, achieve or realize something desired, promised, or predicted. Now, the key words for us in this definition are desires, promises, and predictions. And we'll discuss these in length in this module. 
starting off with desires. One of the most high leverage activities you can commit to as a community builder is to get your members to share their desires. These are their needs, their goals, their wants, their ambitions, etc. And what do you ask them specifically? Now, I don't want to put creative constraints on you by giving you specific copy and paste questions. So instead, I've decided to share with you a principle that will help you come up with all the questions that you need in this regard. Because think of it this way. What do your members want to run towards? They're somewhere right now and there is a target in the future that they want to run towards. There's a goal that they want to achieve. Whatever those are, you must help your members run towards those things. Those things being their desires, their goals, outcomes, wishes, dreams, you name it. And as a bonus, you can ask your members what they don't desire. What are your members running away from? Whatever those are, help your members run away from those things, being their fears, uncertainties, aversions, nightmares, etc. And so here's a little graphic that helps illustrate the whole situation very simply. So here's your member in the middle. This is you. You're assisting them, pushing them forwards, pointing in the right direction. They're running away from their problem and they're running towards their solution. Now, how do you ask your members to share these details with you? Well, you can start by asking them a question in a post, which is a one-to-many format, and it's efficient to send out, but easy to ignore. One-to-many format would be post in your community. It could also be a poll in your community. But more importantly for smaller communities, I would recommend that you reach out to your members in their DMs, which is a one-on-one -on -one format. Although it's time consuming to reach out individually to all your members, it's more difficult for them to ignore and they're far more likely to give you uh, some answers. And again, in my experience for smaller communities, when you're first getting started, communicating in DMs is your best bet for getting the most amount of answers from your members. Therefore, if you want a larger data set to work with and you're just getting started, ask your members questions in their DMs. Plus, your members are far more likely to share more personal answers in a private one-on-one -on -one context than under the comment section of a public post. Not only that, but you can also make use of surveys, but that's beyond the scope of this module, and we'll actually be discussing that in the fifth module of this section. Next up, promises. Promise your members what they desire. This is the next step. Once you know what they desire, promise them what they desire. Now, here's a caveat. Obviously, you don't make promises that you can't keep, okay? Teach what you can and don't get hung up on what currently lies outside of your current abilities. If you don't know what promises to make to your members, simply lean into your strengths to figure out what kinds of promises you're in a position to actually fulfill. And as you could tell, there's this basic Venn diagram here that you can look at. And it's very simple to understand, obviously. So you have your strengths, your, which is basically your skill set. Then you have your members' common problems that they want solved. And then the intersection between these two factors create your offer, create the promise that you can actually fulfill for your members. And so that's important to consider. For example, I've helped build and manage successful communities where members are fulfilled and having a good time. As such, I'm pretty confident that I can share some advice to help make your community better. So you need to figure out what you're in a good position to teach. And it should be noted too that you don't have to promise the world to your members, okay? In all likelihood, your members are attracted to your space because they have one problem of theirs that they believe your community can help them overcome. Therefore, start by promising to help your members with at least one problem of theirs that they share in Kalman and that also leans into your strengths at the same time. Once you've identified these things, you're in a great position to start serving your members to the best of your abilities. Next up, we have predictions. Now, based on your promises or your promise, which is basically your offer, your members will begin to predict what your community can do for them. And they're basically setting expectations. And those expectations must align as much as possible with what you've promised them in your offer. For example, if you have a fitness community that claims to have a protocol that makes members lose 10 pounds of weight in one month, then new members will expect that if they adhere to this protocol, your community will help them lose 10 pounds in one month. Now, if this happens and they realize this goal, they've just had a fulfilling community experience because the expectations that you set for them were met in the promised window of time. However, if this doesn't happen and they actually put in the work, of course, they've just had an unfulfilling community experience because the expectations that you set for them 
weren't met in the promised window of time. So be very calculated in the promises that you make because they set expectations that your members will adopt. Therefore, to fulfill your members, make them achieve something desired, promised, or predicted. Or in other words, align your community's purpose with fulfilling your members' core desires. Welcome to today's module. This is a very important module and it's going to teach you how to effectively onboard new members. Now let's start off by looking at the three onboarding objectives that you need to cover. Number one, you need to assure to newcomers that they made the right decision to join your community. Number two, you need to create a welcoming space. And number three, you need to inspire action in your members. So let's start off with assurance. Even after a new member joins your community, reconfirm their reasons for joining. If possible, highlight the offer that you advertise to these members through your about page, in your content, and in your marketing materials. What's important is that you highlight at the least the core purpose of your community. And for brevity's sake, this is what I did in the Community Builders onboarding welcome video. So you can look at that video for inspiration and it's linked here in the notes. With regards to a welcoming space, create a welcoming environment that encourages newcomers to engage in some form of introductory ritual. And there's no reason to overcomplicate this process. Simply put in place a system that guides your members to make their first contribution. And this is typically an intro post. Like 90% of communities, the first thing that people do is they make an intro post. So keep your onboarding process as simple as possible too. When I'd first built the Community Builders Start Here onboarding course, it was 10 modules in length. It was pretty long for an onboarding course. Now it's only five. So in other words, the onboarding course was reduced by 50%. Therefore, you must be willing to shorten and streamline this process as much as possible because your new members will thank you for this by actually going through the process and introducing themselves. There's no need to overcomplicate the onboarding process, make it as simple and as streamlined as possible for new members, especially if they're unfamiliar with the school platform, right? If your onboarding is too complicated, you risk not having as many people go through with it. Again, what's important is that you make this intro process meaningful to new members. For example, in community builders, you're asked to share your current community goal. This is meaningful and in relation with the interest and themes covered in community builders. In a bodybuilding community, you might share your current physique. In a philosophy community, you might share your favorite quote, etc. Experiment with this process and see what you come up with. Again, you can study the Community Builders onboarding course for inspiration when it comes to yours. However, don't just copy it. That would restrain your creativity, actually. Instead, find inspiration in it. And so to quote the martial arts legend Bruce Lee, adapt what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. Next up, we're going to look at inspiring action. And the way that you're going to go about doing this is by having a roadmap. Now, a roadmap is a detailed plan to guide your members' progress towards a goal. So if you remember this illustration or graphic here from a previous module, you'll notice that this is the roadmap process in a nutshell. And here's what I mean by that. Through a series of clear steps, you're helping your members avoid whatever problem it is that they have. Here it is, they're running away from their problem, so that they can reach whatever solution it is that they desire. And here they are running towards their solution, and here you are helping them out. And throughout this process, you're encouraging members and helping them out by pointing them in the right direction. Now, what is your member's roadmap in specific? What is your member's roadmap? That's important. To figure this out, determine what problem your members have in common and that they want solved. Surely, your members have lots of problems, but what is the pattern that emerges from all of your members? What is that core shared common problem that you can indeed solve for them? For example, here, a problem that members have is low community engagement. But in a bodybuilding community, that could be being skinny fat. Or in a philosophy stoicism community, that could be falling prey to negative emotions, etc. Determine all the steps that exist between point A, which is their problem, all the way to point Z, which is their desired solution, or goal. So for example, in the case of low community engagement as a problem, the steps involved in alleviating that would be DMing members to check in on them, initiating discussions, starting challenges, etc. Whereas with being skinny fat in a bodybuilding community, that could be starting to eat better, hitting the gym more often, committing to XYZ exercise, and so forth. 
And lastly, in the context of a philosophy or stoicism community, that can be reading meditations by Marcus Aurelius, meditating, or even doing introspective journaling. The list goes on and on. Ask yourself then, how can my community's deliverables, which are your courses, live calls, challenges, rewards, coaching, events, etc., how can all of these things, these deliverables, help members travel from point A to point Z? And for each of the steps that you've identified in the previous step, try to have an answer in the form of your community's deliverables. For example, in community builders, you transition from your current state to a more fulfilled state, which is achieving your community goal, by committing to the challenges found in your roadmap. And the roadmap is an entire course that instructs you how to set up a challenge for yourself that keeps you accountable and essentially ensures that you make progress towards your community building and management goals. And these challenges give you the framework, motivation, and accountability required to see your community plans through. Not only that, but you have access to learning materials such as this course that give you the tools required to help your journey from point A to Z be more seamless in the context of this particular community. Whereas in a bodybuilding community, you might have fitness challenges, courses on diet or workouts, personalized coaching, and so forth. And all of these laid out in a particular chronology to address your members' needs at each step of their journey. And so also in a philosophy community, you might have meditation challenges, a book club live call format, journaling prompts, etc. And again, all of these laid out in a particular chronology to address your members' needs at each step of their journey. And so we'll close this section off with good roadmap practices, which are to have clear guidance and instructions, make things as simple as possible. Long-term engagement path. So have a long-term engagement path. This means that you want to stretch out the timeline of your roadmap so that it extends far be out into the future, months out into the future. And this keeps your members active in your community longer because they just simply have a reason to be there and to be more active in the long term, right? Like, let's say, for example, your community members join and you only have a roadmap that extends for only one month. They're likely just going to stay for one month and then after that leave because they have no reason to be there anymore. You've given them no reason to be there anymore. Whereas if you stretch out that roadmap from one month to six months, now they'll be staying for half a year and so forth. You could stretch it out longer. You are the community builder, so all of these sort of creative details are up to you. Also, try to maintain a fast delivery on promises. Most communities promise long-term transformations. However, fast results as soon as a member joins is a great way, too, to create positive feedback loops fast. Now, I'm not contradicting the previous point. Don't worry. This is just to say that you can have a long-term roadmap strategy in your community, but make sure to have a bunch of quick successive wins, if possible, when your member first joins, because this is going to create a positive association, positive feedback loops, and create some momentum for your member going forwards in your community. And so, for example, when members first join community builders, they can make their intro post, which then could get them five likes, and then they gain full access to this course. And this exact series of events can unfold in their first day here, giving newcomers a fast and big win from the jump that creates momentum for them and ensures that they have a positive association with this community as soon as possible. So it's very important to sort of leverage the mechanisms of school or hell, whatever community hosting platform you're on to give your members quick wins fast. In this module, we'll be discussing feedback and why feedback matters. So using surveys for feedback. And with these, you will be collecting insights. So as a community builder, you'll be spending lots of time creating deliverables, courses, live calls, challenges, etc. for your community. And this is a good thing, but you may fall into a trap. And this trap is called familiarity blindness. Familiarity blindness or subjective bias occurs when you become too accustomed with your project after spending hours, days, or even weeks working on it such that your ability to see your work in an objective light diminishes. This is a trap because it may cause you to overlook obvious flaws, assume information is clear when it's not, or fail to see areas of improvement. Therefore, make sure to seek your members' perspectives regarding your community's features so that you can gather unbiased insights. For example, this course, if you have feedback to give on it, please let me know here and there's a link for you to fill out a feedback survey for this course. And you'll notice that the provided survey is a Google form 
And that's what I recommend for creating your own surveys because Google Forms is not only user friendly, but it's also 100% free to use as well. One other important detail is that you're going to want to make use of surveys to gather anonymous feedback. While dropping a post or poll in your community section is convenient, it isn't private because you and other members can view each other's comments and or votes. Therefore, if you want more raw and honest community feedback, make use of anonymous surveys to get the best and most unfiltered answers out of your members. And note, specify, make sure to specify in your survey descriptions that your anonymous surveys are indeed anonymous in nature. And so if I click here to access the form in question, you'll see that this survey is marked as anonymous. Next up, assessing feedback. Make sure to actually optimize your community's deliverables based on your members' feedback. Remember to listen intently to your members, especially if you're running a paid community and people are literally giving you their hard-earned cash to be there. Make your members' opinions count. Make your community worth their while. Remember this. 